This is the Global Mom Show, Episode 1. Hi, I'm Mary Grace Otis, and you're listening to The Global Mom Show. Do you love to travel, learn about other cultures, or open your home to people from around the world? Maybe you live and work abroad. Maybe you used to, or maybe you wish you did now. Maybe you live in a big city with lots of opportunities for global connection, or maybe you live in a small town like I do, and you want to find ways to connect yourself and your kids with a global view of life. Well, whatever the case, The Global Mom Show will encourage and inspire you to live a global life wherever you are and teach your kids to do the same. Each week, I'll connect you with moms around the world who are living globally-minded lives as educators, authors, immigrants, expats, development workers, business owners. Well, you get the idea. I can't wait to share their stories with you and to hear yours as well. Here we go. Today, we welcome Becky Morales to the show. Becky is an ESL and Spanish teacher, and she's also a mother of five. She's the founder of the Kid World Citizen website, which offers parents and educators activities that help young minds go global. Her work has been featured on Scholastic, the U.S. Department of Education, NBC Latino, MSN, PBS Kids, and more. She's an author, trainer, speaker, and educational consultant. Welcome to the show, Becky. Thank you so much. It's so great to have you here today. I can't wait to find out more about you. Tell me a little bit about yourself and your family. Okay, so we live in Houston, Texas. Um, I'm a transplant here from Chicago. Um, My husband and I met when we were in college. He was actually an exchange student from Mexico, and I had just gotten back from studying abroad, so they paired us up, and we were buddies, (laughs) and I was supposed to show him around. Um, So we met, and um, later we got married, and we had two daughters, biological daughters, and I couldn't have any more kids, and we adopted my son from China, and then a couple years later, we adopted my other son from Ethiopia. And just this past November, we adopted our youngest son, who's two right now, um, from foster care from the United States. So we have this kind of interesting blend of cultures in our family, um, which it's not totally surprising because when I was growing up, my brother and sister were adopted from Peru. So we kind of have this um, interesting mixture of all these different cultures, and it's a very lively and energetic um, group of kids. (laughs) Yeah. And how old is your oldest? So my oldest right now, my two oldest are both 11 in fifth grade. And then I have um, an, two eight-year-olds also. <laughs> and then okay. I have a two-year-old. So from two okay. to 11. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. And tell me about Kid World Citizen. When did you start blogging and why did you decide to do that? So I used to be on all these Yahoo groups for adoptive parents. And I would share ideas for how parents could not only teach their kids about their heritage culture, but also a lot of parents, we like to go into the schools, maybe into the preschool or into kindergarten and teach the class about our kids' culture because a lot of times schools don't do a lot of multicultural lessons. And so to help our kids fit in, I was writing a lot of these lesson plans and sharing what I was doing. And so I thought, this was back in 2011, I thought, well, let me just make up a blog for adoptive families and because I had to keep copying and pasting the same emails to people that were asking me questions. So I put it up and then I started um, gaining followers kind of quickly. And some of the people were noticing that I was mostly just doing Mexico, China, and Ethiopia because those were the cultures that we had. And they were like, well, can you do, you know, Kazakhstan and can you do South Africa? So I started researching and I was slowly adding different activities from different parts of the world. And then it just turned into, okay, obviously my audience has grown way beyond just adoptive parents. It's just any parents who want to teach their kids about the world. So yeah, yeah, it just, it kind of grew and and that's where we are right now. Well, uh, for anyone who hasn't checked out Becky's blog, you definitely have to. It just has so many resources um, for parents. I'm just amazed at how much you've done. So how many years have you been at this now? So I've been writing this blog since 2011. Um, okay. so yeah, about five years. Okay. So that's long enough to get a ton of book lists on there, <laughs> which is what I love. I just can't wait to start reading some of those with mm-hmm, my kids. Mm-hmm. I've already found some of them at the library and just 
keep saying, oh, I want to buy more books. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what are you doing now? You're, are you currently teaching or just blogging? What are you doing? Tell us about so that. So right now, since we have our two-year-old, I just tutor after school. Um, we live really close to the high school, so kids can kind of walk home on their way home from school. So I tutor in Spanish and ESL, and then I also do cultural programs for our local schools, and then I do some teacher trainings um, just for you know continuing ed. I'll do like a diversity training or how to incorporate multicultural literature into the class. Um, so keeping myself busy and probably when my youngest, Mario, maybe in a couple years, I'll go back into the classroom. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you were an ESL teacher yeah, before. Yeah, ESL and Spanish. Spanish. And then I have my um, master's in school counseling. I haven't worked a lot in school counseling yet, but I hope to get back into that. Okay, great. Now, tell us about when you first got a vision for the world and global living. You already mentioned that you had siblings who are adopted from other places. So did that kind of start things out for you? Or were you, was your family always interested in global ideas? Well, I... It's funny, when I was really little, my dad has always been a pilot, and so he always would travel to these, to me, very exotic places as a kid. You know, he would say how he saw the sand dunes when he was flying over Saudi Arabia, and he would visit, you know, walk around the temples when he was in Japan. And so it kind of always intrigued me that he got to, you know, just yesterday he was over here in Japan, and then today he's here, and you know, in Chicago where I was growing up, I just couldn't understand it. And I always wanted to be like that. Um, And then when I was 15, we adopted my brother and sister from Peru. um, And my mom and dad went on the first trip. But on the second trip, they asked me if I would go instead of my mom and I could help my dad take care of them. And it was just mind blowing and eye opening. And I got I had been to Mexico before, but that, you know, I had never been First of all, I had never seen a mountain range. That was really funny because I remember the moment when I was on the airplane and I always pictured a mountain range being like one layer of mountains, you know, just like a mountain after each other. Right. And then when we were flying and it was like, no, it took us, you know, an hour to cross the Andes and it was like never ending. I just remember my mind being like, okay, the the world is not what I thought it was. (laughs) And um, being able to visit Machu Picchu and practice my really low basic Spanish at that time it was just awesome and amazing. And I vowed that I would also adopt when I grew up and I also wanted to travel a lot. And it just grew from there. And how would you say that all of that has affected your family life now and today? Did that affect even what you majored in in college and, and all of that? Or? It totally did. So I'm really more of a math and science person. Like I always excelled in the math and science areas. And when I was going to college, I didn't even take Spanish my senior year. Um, and then when I got to college, I knew I wanted to study abroad. And I went in and I was like, I know I want to be a teacher and I want to study abroad. And there were um, a, a lot of other things happened, but they were like, well, if you were a Spanish teacher, you know, the whole, <laughs> all of your classes, would you would get credit for. I'm like, okay, I think I'm going to be a Spanish teacher. <laughs> <laughs> So I stopped being a math teacher and I changed my major over and um, I studied abroad once in Spain and then once in Ecuador. And it was just awesome. I would do it again. (laughs) Yeah, I would love to study abroad again. That would be great. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Tell me about, okay, I I asked before, how has that affected your family life today? And then I changed questions (laughs) on you. So let's go back to that. How has that affected your family life today? What do you feel like the multiculturalism, you know, you've got a husband who's from Mexico, you've got all these multicultural children. Do you feel like you're different from people around you and everyone's looking at you saying, how did they do that? What are they doing? Or do you just feel like this is just normal? You know, it's funny because without anyone around us, it just feels normal. You know, it'll just be um, just, you know, me, me and the kids and we're reading or we're doing this. But we do always have this extra multicultural aspect, like what, like, for example, this month is Black History Month. And so I've been getting out a bunch of books for my kids, all of the kids, to learn um, different little biographies and autobiographies of different um, black characters and leaders and, you know, um, musicians and athletes. 
throughout history. And it's like, I probably wouldn't have thought of that if all of my kids were white. I don't know. I might have. I don't really know because I don't have that situation. But it's like, like, you know, when January comes around, we start planning for Chinese New Year. And we're like, okay, what are we going to do this year? And it's just like a natural thing. Like, okay, so we got to find where we're going to go party and where we're going to go eat and what we're going to make this year. <laughs> and it's, it's just something that we've just really incorporated to the, fa- to the point where when my daughter, my youngest daughter was in kindergarten, she told the teacher that she was part Ethiopian. (laughs) She's not, she's Mexican American, but they were saying something about like what your heritage is. And she was like, I'm Mexican and I'm American and I'm Ethiopian and I'm Chinese. And the teacher was like, wow, that's like a lot. Yeah, that's that's a lot. (laughs) And then later, like the teacher met me and was like, oh, okay, I I see what she was trying to say. (laughs) But it's like each of the kids feel like they have part of that because it, it's what our family culture is. And so they feel like they share a part of, you know, at least they know something about the culture and I think they're proud of it. Right. Do you feel like it's helped that your husband is from a different culture? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think that, um, so because he moved here when he was, we, he moved here when we got married. So he was 25. And so, um, we have always been going back to Mexico to visit his family and they've been coming to visit us and we've had to navigate, you know, how are we going to celebrate Christmas? Are we going <laughs> to, you know, which holiday, which traditions are we going to pick and choose from each of our cultures, right. which has been really fun. I mean, sometimes you don't even realize like New Year's is really big in Mexican culture for families. It's, and you know, in the U S it's more kind of like, who you're dating or you would go out with your husband, but in Mexico, it's very much family. And so at first when we were dating, I'm like, so we're spending new years with your family. Like, okay, that's interesting. It was, just yeah. And he was like, well, of course that's like, it's kind of like our Thanksgiving, you know, like it's a big meal and we stay up and I'm like, okay. And at, at first I was like, well, I kind of just want to go dancing with you, but okay. <laughs> so we've kind of, you know, we've adapted and we've, um, it's, it's really fun because we have so many more parties and celebrations since we have all these cultures to, um, represent in our household. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Now you do so many great book roundups on your blog. Tell us about the role that books have played in your own family life in terms of exposing your kids to different cultures. Yeah, I love reading books and I'm a huge fan of public libraries. I just think they're awesome. Every time I pay an overdue fine, I'm just like happily paying because I just feel like we're so fortunate because a lot of countries don't have public libraries like we do. But um, so I love reading books and I think it's a really easy way. It's really accessible even for kids who have never heard about another culture and they might live in the most rural, homogeneous, you know, um, community that, and they've never met someone from another culture or country or color or religion. But I think books are so easy because you just get so involved in the story and the characters that it's not like us versus them. It's just like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? And so I think mm-hmm. with a good story and, um, you know, good content, but also good illustrations, you can teach the kids so much without overtly saying, you know, really, we're all alike in the whole world. We all want to be happy. We all have families. We all live in houses. We all eat together. It's just so much easier to read a story. And then um, the kids just pick up on that without you having to tell them. And I love that. I I mean, any time that parents can go to the library and pick up books with characters that are somehow just a little bit different than your own kids, then I think that that's going to be the learning experience. Do you have one or two books that you're reading right now with your kids that you can share with us? Yeah, right now at this very moment, I was just, um, literally, I have them on the kitchen table because a lot of times we read during dinner, which sounds funny, but we eat so late. Um, So I just have a couple books for uh, Black History Month. I got out about like 20 different books because I'm going to do another roundup. And we found a really good one called Gordon Parks. It's a, a black photographer that took pictures and was quite famous. He was in um, Life magazine and a couple other places, but he also took pictures in the civil rights, but it's just a little tiny biography, but it's for kids and it's a picture book. And my kids really liked it. Um, We also read this nice little book called, let me see where it is. um, Harlem's Little Bird. It's the story of Florence Mills. And she is this, um, well, it starts when she was a little girl and she just had this beautiful, beautiful voice. 
And the theme of the book, she keeps saying, um, if my voice is powerful enough to do this, what else can it do? So it'll have different things that she did um, with her voice. And then she keeps saying, well, what else can I do? And she ends up, one time she's supposed to perform in a theater and they won't let her family in with her because it's an all white theater. And she's like, okay, then I don't want to sing if they can't see me. And um, she makes the guy basically beg for her, like, no, 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 okay, they can come in, and it's okay, we're going to change the rules for you. But it's amazing because she's just like this young girl when it happens, and it's all about um, how she's very, very famous, and she travels all over the world singing. And it, it's it's a really cute book, too. My kids love the illustrations because it's kind of like cartoony. But, yes, yeah, so I have a bunch of books for Black History Month. I have a, a Paul Robeson book. I've got Little Melba and Her Big Trombone. Uh, with Books and Bricks, which is how Booker T. Washington built a school. Uh, a very new one that just won is going to win a blue bonnet, an award for next year. It's called John Roy Lynch. And he grew up as a slave, but he ended up being elected when he was freed. He was elected to the state um, House of Representatives, I think, in Mississippi. And it's uh, all about his life during Reconstruction. So lots of books about that's what's going to be coming up on the blog in a couple of days if I finish. Great. Well, by the time this airs, it'll definitely yeah. be up and um, we will definitely link to that in the show notes and we'll have those titles for people. Perfect. <laughs> it's just great. You know, I love reading with my kids too. I find we're doing some experimenting with homeschool right now because we're on kind of a traveling mm -hmm. um, portion of our year. And I just find when I try to sit there and teach them things, it's just and not very effective. But when we can just sit on the couch and read books for yeah. 45 minutes, they're just enthralled and we can have discussions and they, you know, later on they'll remember it. And it's just amazing what story can do. And that's just really one of my favorite things. So it's really neat that you have that. Um, you also have a lot of recipes on your blog. Tell, tell me about one of your favorite recipes that you like to make with your kids. I love making bread, different kinds of breads. First of all, because I love eating bread, but also I think any kid, even if they're picky, will try bread. I mean, it's right, but there's so yeah. many different kinds. And so we made this really, this is my kid's favorite recipe, this pau de queijo from Brazil. And it's like a cheese bread made out of, um, tapioca flour, I think it is. And so it's gluten-free, which just happens to be gluten-free. And it's really chewy. It's nothing like you've ever had before. It's so good. And <laughs> my kids love it because it makes a big batch of dough and then they just have to roll the little balls, which are like the size of um, uh, maybe like smaller than a mandarin orange, just like these little tiny balls. Like dumplings? Yeah, kind of, kind of like dumplings. And you roll them out and then you put them on a, a, a cookie sheet, you know, put it in the oven and they're so so good. They're my favorite. Oh gosh, they're so good. But uh, so we actually do an international bread day at our school and we have all the kids bring in a bread from a different culture and they take a paper plate and you can do this at home. They take a paper plate and they draw the flags of what was brought in. So like they would draw a little Brazil flag and then they would get to take a little piece of bread and put it on there. And like if someone brought in Pandul, say from Mexico, they would draw a little Mexico flag and put it there. And so they go and they fill up their plate with little tiny samples and then they get to sample them and kind of look at the flag and see where it's from. And it's so funny because, um, really kids, our, our school is super diverse. We have so many different cultures and kids would even say like, I didn't know China had bread. I thought you guys only had rice. And they're like, no, we've got steamed buns, you know? And then, um, someone brought in, I, I don't remember some kind of Filipino bread. And again, they were like, Filipinos, I didn't know you guys had bread. It was just, it's, it was so interesting to, um, see all the different variety. And then also the kids got so excited. They were walking out of class a day going, this is the best day ever. Like they love. Oh, that. that's great. <laughs> that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have a link to that? A Brazilian I do. I'll bread? Give it to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, cause that's actually gluten-free and my kids would love Oh, there that. you go. Mm -hmm. I don't know gluten. So that would be wonderful. You know, it's so funny that you said that cause my, we have some Japanese heritage. My husband is half Japanese. Mm. And so, um, my kids just eat seaweed all the time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like they just love it. And everyone looks at them like that. What is, what are you doing? You're having seaweed like for breakfast. They're like, yeah, we love seaweed. <laughs> this is the most normal thing ever. Yeah. So it's just fun how, um, 
how food is just an entryway into cultures. And even, you know, I think if we start kids young, then they don't have all these preconceived notions when they're older. Like, I'm not trying that. That's weird. So it's just a way to kind of expose kids early on to things. Yeah. And they're much more likely to try it if they made it. You know, it's something like you rolled out the bread or you made, we just made Chinese dumplings. And even my daughter who doesn't normally, I don't know, she doesn't like dumplings for sure. She tried it because she helped roll it out and she helped do it. And she was like, well, I got to see what it tastes like. And she said it wasn't that bad. I'm like, okay, good. (laughs) Good. Now, how did you get this bread day started at your school? So, okay. So that was one thing I did when we first came here. Our school is super, super diverse. And I asked if we had any kind of international club and they were like, no, we don't really do, you know, any kind of international week or anything. And so I asked if I could start it and they were like, sure, if you want to. Um, And so what I did is before school started, I had a big display and I said, can you say friend in another language? And so all these people were coming over to me and they're like, I know how to say it in Spanish. I know how to say it in whatever. And I got their emails. And so it was a lot of parents who wouldn't normally volunteer, either because they don't speak English well or they don't have a culture of volunteering. A lot of countries, you're not really allowed to volunteer in school, so it's just not something you're used to. Um, And so I got all these uh, moms, and I said, okay, let's try and make our school a little more international. So we made up some displays for the walls, and we did like a Thanksgiving luncheon for the teachers, kind of like a potluck. We all brought in different foods. And we put on this international um, week in March. We do it every year the week before spring break. Now it's like a tradition. I've done it for five, six years. And um, every day we do something different. So one day we do, we wanted to do just like a potluck, but the school board is really strict on what food you can bring in. And bread was something that you can usually buy. Like, you know, you can go Mm -hmm. to any bakery and like, so they let us do that because it has to be store bought at our, at our school. So okay. we um we did it and we didn't realize how much of a success it would be. I mean, it, literally the kids were like, this is the best day ever. <laughs> so we do that. We do a little parade around the school with national costume. And what we do to make everyone feel comfortable is like you could wear your national dress, you know, like a sari or whatever you have from your um, country, or you can wear a sports or travel shirt from your, from a country. I mean, it doesn't have to be your culture. So Lots of our American kids will wear like soccer jerseys or baseball uniforms or football uniforms or whatever, because we say that represents a culture in a way, you know, like wearing a uniform. Um, um, And so we kind of parade through the school. It's so popular. I I think the first year, maybe like 50 kids did it out of 700. And now it's well, well over half the kids. I want to say like probably three fourths. It's so popular. And then all the parents come, they're taking pictures. We do, um, and then we do some kind of an art project. So like some years we've done everyone do a flag from their heritage. Some years we've done um, multicultural dolls. And I have that on my website too, where we, we you dress up a doll of typical clothes from a country. Um, one year, oh, we've done oh. diversity quilts very frequently. So the idea of a diversity quilt is every kid gets a quilt square and they do their family culture. And it doesn't necessarily mean a country culture. It's like what's important in your family. So like you might draw a cross if you're Christian, you might draw a football if your family always watches, you know, Sunday football, or you might draw, I mean, you usually have a combination of symbols and they talk to the kids about what a symbol means and how can you represent your family. And so, um, it's funny cause you'll get, you know, it'll get like a Colombian flag and then a soccer ball and then, um, a baseball and like a camping, like a tent or whatever their family is into, you know, the kids can draw and then they talk about it. And then we make a big quilt on the, in the hallways. Oh, cool. That is, it's so neat to hear about all these ideas because I live in a really small community with not much diversity at all. And I'm just kind of, my wheels are turning of, okay, how could we incorporate this Mm -hmm. type of thing into our school? Cause I feel like, um, you know, it's just important in those like pockets where there is limited diversity to somehow find a way to bring that in. Absolutely. Even Mm -hmm. when it's not naturally, naturally there. So Mm -hmm. those are some great ideas. Um, I know that you're a language teacher and I'm curious how you've incorporated language learning into your home. So, so we do speak, the kids speak Spanish with my husband 
and I try to speak Spanish with them as much as I can. But I'm going to tell you that as a busy mom or when I'm getting mad or stressed out, it just English comes out first. But ideally, we would be speaking more Spanish at home. Um, what we do in our family is we use the summers to travel and uh, typically go to a Spanish speaking country. So like this year, we're going to go to Peru for six weeks and we'll get um, either a tutor or the kids can go to like a summer camp or they do something so that they're completely immersed in the language. We really should be speaking more Spanish throughout the year and we try to, but it, it, it is hard that because they're in English school all day, you know, so that right. luckily my two-year-old actually goes to a bilingual preschool. So he is really picking up Spanish fast. Um, he's awesome. But we read books. We take out books from the library in Spanish. We watch YouTube videos in Spanish. We'll put the movie on. You know, if it has a Spanish track on the TV, we'll put it on. Um, we have visitors. We've had exchange students. Um, we've, um, we have a lot of friends from Spain and Colombia. And when we get together, at least the kids are listening to Spanish. A lot of times the kids will speak right. English and then the adults speak Spanish. That's kind of typical what happens. But at least they'll be exposed to it. Um, we've gone to church in Spanish. I'm trying to think. I really, anything we can, we go to like Day of the Dead um, presentations where they're in Spanish. So we try and do it <laughs> as yeah. much as we can. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so challenging. My husband and I, we both speak German and it's just, you know, we speak to each other, but we just have a hard time mm -hmm. committing to mm -hmm. speak to our kids. Mm -hmm. It's just a challenge. So I'm always looking for other things that people are doing yeah. to bring it in naturally. And um, that's why I just love, you know, all your ideas because I'm the kind of mom that is like, okay, what should we do for cultural <laughs> ideas? I want to do them all, but coming up with them is just um, more of a challenge for me. So I love having a resource to go to where um, you've pulled together so many things. Mm -hmm. What about for moms who have never done anything. They're just starting to get interested in global ideas. And it just seems so overwhelming. Like one more thing I have to do. Okay, I've got to feed my kid healthy meals. I've got to <laughs> get them interested in music. I need to do this, that and the other. How are they supposed to incorporate, you know, global ideas? What advice would you give for just starting to interest their children in the world? So when I first started, when the kids were little, um, Everything you just mentioned, like feeding healthy meals, listening to music, reading books, you know, maybe exercising. I'm trying to think of what else we do as moms. All of those things, you can incorporate global learning without extra effort or even without extra time. Like if you're going to read to your kids every night anyway, 20 minutes, pick a couple books that are from another country. Or if you're going to be cooking anyway for your kids, if you can find some easy recipes, I mean, really easy. Like we do, um, you can do smoothies and just while you're making the smoothie, you're like, did you know that this papaya came from Costa Rica? That's crazy. Go look at the globe. Where's Costa Rica? You know, just kind of really simple things if that you're already going to be doing. You're eating pasta. Do you guys know where pasta comes from? Did you know it's from Italy? But before that, it came from China. Let's look where on the map. Like, I think at, you're already going to be doing those, um, you know, the everyday things that moms have to do. But if you can have a globe or like a world map placemat that's already at your table, and it's kind of, we have a globe in my kitchen, we have world map placemats, and then we have another world map that I just like tape to the wall. And it's so useful because anytime anything happens, like remember when the song Happy came out, um, I think it was last year or whenever, two years ago, and then everyone started putting up happy videos where they would be dancing. My kids and I, my kids were obsessed with watching the dancing ones. And every time it would say where it's from, like, oh, these kids are in Ethiopia doing the happy dance. And so I'd be like, remember where Ethiopia is? And we would look on the map and while we're watching the kids dance. And then, oh, these kids are from Slovakia. And they're like, where the heck is Slovakia? So we would go look on a map and they're like, oh, it's in Europe. So it's like every little thing you're already going to be doing with your kids, it's really easy to integrate global learning because it's somehow related to something from another country, whether you're right. saying like where the ingredients are from or where the dish is from or where this music is from or where this book is from. You can always kind of incorporate it in whatever you're doing. That's why I think it's, it's, it's overwhelming, but at the same time, it's, it can be really easy. Whatever your kids are interested in, if they're interested in sports, talk about sports. Like if they're, if they want to watch the Olympics, like great, find out where the, all the athletes are from. If they really like music, they try and just like, while you're making dinner, play music from another country, you know, 
Yeah. So it's, it, yeah, I think it is easier than we make it, mm-hmm. you know, and if we just do something right in the moment instead of think, I have to have this whole curriculum. Yeah. <laughs> We just think, you know, right then, let's just say something and go to the globe and do it immediately. That just makes it so much more accessible. Mm -hmm. Now, what tips or resources do you have for people looking to teach their children or at least expose their children to different languages, maybe if they don't speak another language themselves? Yeah, so that's really good. One thing now that we didn't have so much when my oldest were younger is all these apps that are on um, the computer and on your iPad and on your phone. There's so many language learning apps. Um, even right now, my bigger kids, actually the four bigger ones, I'm making them do Duolingo for Spanish. And it's so great because it teaches them reading and writing and like spelling and even pronunciation. But even for little kids, there's like the feed me, um, the feed the monster one. It's like, super, super simple. Supposedly a two or three year old can do it and it teaches them little words in Spanish. So apps is one way, but also, um, like for example, if you're going to watch a baby Einstein video, you can take the baby Einstein video and just put it in Spanish and babies don't care. I mean, like little kids don't even notice sometimes when you change it. One time I accidentally put it in French. I wasn't paying attention and my kids watched the whole thing. (laughs) And I walk in, I'm like, Oh, you guys are watching it in French. And they're like, yeah, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Well, I figure at least they're hearing yeah. different ac- accents totally. and different voices. And, you know, that's how I feel about German. At least they're they're hearing it now yeah. when they're little. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, maybe we can list, um, I don't know, do you have links I to do. some of those yeah, apps I'll on your you. website? Okay. And there's some books too. I have one great, great list of Spanish books for non-native speakers. It's like what the book that I'm thinking of at the top of my head is called like I'm Margaret Soy Margarita. It's two girls that meet at the park and one of them only speaks English and one only speaks Spanish. And they have this whole conversation. It's so cleverly written because like you don't have to speak Spanish to understand what's going on the way they write it. It's just so good. So I have a list of books um, for non-native speakers. Yeah. Great. Um, Tell me what are some of the benefits and challenges that you face raising a multicultural family? Well, so some of the benefits are that we're all learning about all the cultures, right? So it's not just, um, you know, Ricky, come over here. We're going to quick talk about Ethiopia. It's like, if we're going to go to an Ethiopian restaurant, uh, we all go. And then we all learn how to eat with injera. And it just totally enriches my kids' lives because I really think about like, if we didn't have Ricky and our family, I'm not sure that my girls would even have heard of Ethiopia by now because it's, you know, it would just be some country they didn't have a connection to. So I think that it's just completely opened their minds and they're more aware. Like it's almost like they listen harder. Like, like when they hear something that would be relevant to someone in the family, they'll come home and tell me like, mommy, did you know that there's a kid in my class and he's from Kenya and that's right next to Ethiopia? And I'm like, oh, and he's like, yeah, his mommy wants to meet you. And she also said they're really good runners in Kenya. I'm like, they are. (laughs) It's really funny. But um, that really happened one time. But so it's, it's like they wouldn't have known that they wouldn't have been maybe as open or they wouldn't have, it it probably just would have like gone over their head before. So I think it's really enriched us because we've all learned so much more um, about different cultures and just being, um, I think it's increased their empathy too, because we do read a lot of stories and I tell them a lot about news stories of what's going on in the world. And just from a humanitarian perspective, you know, not the nitty gritty political details, but just like Syrian refugees and they listen and they're, they can put themselves in the place of the kids and they just, it, it the innocence of children, they're just naturally empathetic. Like they want to help and they want to know, oh, you know, I hope that they're okay tonight. I bet that's really scary that they have to sleep outside or they just come up with things and you, you're just like, it warms your heart to think of what your kids can come up with when you explain it a certain way. Now. Okay, I'm just going to interrupt you from answering the rest of my question here because <laughs> that just gets me thinking. You know, I your kids are a little bit older than mine, mm-hmm. so um, but that's one thing that I struggle with a lot of times is knowing, you know, how much to share. I mean, I have a five year old and a three year old and a one year old who obviously can't talk yet, but you know, just even with the five year old and three year old and knowing what books 
might be just too much for them. You know, what I don't want them to know Mm -hmm. yet and not wanting to spoil that innocence, but also just at the same time, they need to be aware of what's really going on because there's kids that are experiencing that right now that are three and five and they're not being spared, you know? So it's just, but it's, it's been a challenge for me to, to figure out, you know, at what age level things are appropriate. What's your take on that? Yeah. I, there's like some quote that always goes around Facebook that's attributed to Mr. Rogers. And I don't know if it's really his quote or not, but he says to always look for the good people. I don't know if you've seen that kind of floating yes, around. Yeah. I don't know if he always look for the helpers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But I really do like if we ever do read a book. OK, so we just read something that I was I didn't know how it was going to go over with my kids. It was called Separate But Not Equal or something. It's a, it's a new book and it talks about in California how these Mexican migrant workers were not allowed to go to the good public school. They had to go to this really, really um, you know, shoddy one that had just, it was dirty and it wasn't a good education. And then this family, the Mendez family, like fights to get their daughter to be able to go to a better school. And it was really kind of deep and heavy. And, and I kept telling the kids, you know, there are really good people. There's a lot of really, really good people. And then there's a couple people that are not so good and they don't make good choices and they kind of, they can't understand other people. And so, cause I don't want them to think, well, you don't want them to develop stereotypes when you're trying to dispel them. Right. You know? Like I don't want them to think at first I'm like, you know, reading this, I don't want them to think everyone in California is bad. You know, they don't like, you know, Mexicans or whatever stereotype they could come up with. So I told them it was, you know, a long time ago. Some people thought that um, if you had brown skin, you couldn't go, you know, and I kind of explain it in a right. really elementary way. And I think that that's how we can do current events and that's how we can do anything that comes up very, very kind of like watered down for the younger kids, not because we want to water it down, but just because it's not appropriate for them to have these like, you know, nightmares at night or something. Right. I know. But just to let them know, like sometimes it was unfair, you know, my kids in kindergarten. Okay. So when Ricky was in kindergarten, a kid told him, Ricky's black, he's from Ethiopia. A kid told him, my mom told me I can't play with black people. And what? I had not taught him about civil rights yet. I hadn't told right. him that their racism existed. I mean, he just had never. And so when it happened, I was like, I mean, ironically, the teacher was black. And so it's so when I told the teacher, she's like, oh, well, I guess the mom's not going to want to have a conference with me because <laughs> she's going to have to yeah. talk. You know, she's like, I don't know how that's going to work. But she said, I'll talk to him. And, you know, she talked to the kid and the kid kind of didn't really know what he was saying. He was just repeating, I'm sure, what he learned at home. And he was Chinese. I mean, it, it was just like the most funny situation because it's like, I'm sure in the future he will be discriminated against at some point. But um, it was like, OK, so we do need to talk to kids when even when they're five, because right. they, they could be sitting next to him when that happens. And then they could be the one that says, hey, that's not right. He's my friend, you know. Like, don't say that to him. Or even if they're not the ones who are experience, experiencing it, like, for the, you know, to themselves, for themselves they'll still right. be listening to it. And so I think even the younger kids have to know that some people think that. And if your friends are ever sad, you need to speak up for them and make sure that no one, you know, bullies them. Or, I, you know, I don't even know if little kids know what the word bully means, but you would have to explain it on their level. Yeah, well, if they have siblings, they probably yeah. don't believe me, <laughs> at least in my house. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> so, okay. So uh, back to my original question was, what is one of the challenges you face raising a multicultural family? And I'm guessing that some of what you just told me might fall into that category. Yeah, I mean, with all that's going on in the, in the U.S. right now, I never thought, I, I mean, I have police officers in my family and we love the police. But I did have to give my son the talk that if you are ever, ever pulled over, I want you to put your hands up and not say anything back. You know, I had to have this conversation that I thought I wouldn't have to have until he was a teenager. But just in case, I mean, I just want him to know because he is kind of a silly kid and he might, I I just don't even know what could happen. You know, you hear about that kid in Ohio that was shot when he was at the park and it just it scares me because I don't think I would have been scared if I would just have, you know, only white children, but having a little boy who's black, I just want to make sure that nothing ever happens to him and make sure over, over protective, you know, 
if any cop pulls you over, even if you didn't do anything wrong, I want you to put your hands up and keep your mouth quiet and just do whatever he says, even if he's doing something wrong or right or whatever. And it, that's something I never thought I would ever, I've never even crossed my mind until the past couple of years when all this has been going on. Yeah. It's so disheartening. It really is. Yeah. Um, okay. Back to, um, travel. You mentioned that in the summers, uh, you guys get to travel now. Does your husband get off work as well? He only gets off a week or two. So he'll come either at the beginning or the end, or sometimes like a week at the beginning, a week at the end. Um, so I, <laughs> I'm going to be alone, but my sister lives in Peru. So this year is going to be easy because we're going to, she's going to come stay with us. We'll rent an apartment and kind of all stay together. But, okay. Mm-hmm. Where where else have you been? So last year, it was my parents' wedding anniversary. And so we took a huge road trip through Europe and we visited. My grandparents were from Germany originally and my the other set was from Slovenia. And so we went to Germany and Slovenia and then we visited Tonio's cousins in France. So we kind of had this big circle of Europe in a road trip that lasted like three and a half weeks. Um, wow. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. And it was a kind of a caravan because my parents were there With and my two sisters. A one year old? Yeah. Yeah, that was. Okay. <laughs> Luckily, there were more adults than kids. We kind of just balanced that out. So, <laughs> yeah, I almost feel like like flying an airplane with a one year old would be easier than a road trip. But I'm, yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, we just traveled from Northern Michigan down to Florida oh, with wow. our three kids and you know, I was just like, okay, <laughs> we're going to get there eventually. Just keep moving. Yeah, yeah. But um that sounds awesome. Is this something that you guys, I mean, I'm sure you save for it, you budget for it, you plan for it. It's yeah. just something that one you guys want to be an important part of your kids' life. Yeah, it's just something that is a priority. So basically all the money, yeah, we can save for it throughout the year from my tutoring or my work. And then, um, my husband travels a lot so we can use miles for tickets. And we really think it's important for the kids to travel and be exposed to other cultures. I mean, I personally, of course, I would love if we could live abroad, but it's just not happening with my husband's work. And so, the be- the second best thing would you know is to have the summers abroad and many many times we go to mexico we've gone we've had the kids in this little summer camp that my husband actually went to when he was a kid and um so then we stay with my in-laws so that's a really reasonable and really fun summer um and it, you know, they obviously get to practice Spanish and see family. And there's like so many benefits of that. Right. This year, my sister just got a Fulbright and she's living in Peru for the year. So we thought, well, this will be perfect. Then we'll go to Peru and visit her. Oh. Um, future trips we have planned. We want to take my kids to China so my son can visit the orphanage where he um, started off. And then maybe even further in the future, go to Ethiopia so the kids can see um, my other son's heritage culture. Neat. Can you share any travel tips for helping kids travel with an open mind or be prepared for the cultural language and food differences that they might come across? Yeah. So most of my kids are not picky with eating, but my one daughter, she's got a bunch of allergies and she's vegetarian. And so it's just like, sometimes some cultures just don't understand the concept of vegetarian. Yeah. So she like our secret <laughs> is to bring a couple of cans of black beans for emergencies only. <laughs> and we keep them in my suitcase. Like when we went to China, we did that and it was like, okay, she hasn't eaten in two days. Let's break out the can of beans. <laughs> and like, we order some plain white rice and give it to her. And she's like the happiest she's ever been, you know, <laughs> but I yeah. think, um, the, what what we can do at home beforehand is I always my my kids have to eat fresh fruits and vegetables as you know all the time every different texture because I feel like worst case scenario maybe you don't like the sauces and you don't like the meats and like you know all this mixture but you can go to a supermarket and go buy an orange like you can go buy right. you know a banana or something so that's like. The one tip is don't feel like you have to eat in restaurants when you travel. We, even in China, even in Ethiopia, even in Europe, like we always went to farmer's markets or supermarkets or just to get like whole foods, you know, just regular, like a bag of carrots or like an avocado or whatever. Um, 
And it's nice if you can have a knife with you, if you can pack it in your check bag so you can open up the avocado or cut the tomato or whatever. We were eating whole cucumbers in Germany. Like I literally would pass out cucumbers to each kid and they were just biting it like an apple. <laughs> My kids do that all the time. It's great. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, those are great tips. Thanks. Um, okay. Last question before we get into the quick round. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about your book, The Global Education Toolkit. Mm-hmm. So I had gotten on Twitter, my sister told me to, and I followed like five people. And one of the people that I followed was Homa Tavangar. She's an awesome author. She wrote Growing Up Global. And she's actually going to be coming on the show. Oh, fantastic. Also, Hi, Homa. So, yeah. <laughs> she's, Not sure when, in the next couple of weeks. She's so. great. So I had seen her tweet and she said, does anyone want to work on a collaborative project? And so I emailed her like, sure, I will. And we were going to just do a 20-page ebook about how to set up an international night for your school. And it turned into a 275-page, heavily researched, like hundreds and hundreds of resources for how to incorporate global learning into the classroom and really into home. All of the ideas in the book are things that people can do at home. It doesn't have to be in the classroom. But it's just more of like a learning um, toolkit. And so it just has so many ideas for how, like what we were just talking about, how to pick books out or how to do, how to get involved using the internet to connect with people in other countries. So we know about pen pals, right? You can write a letter and, you know, wait a couple of weeks and get it back. But there's so many other ways. There's collaborative art projects where you do half the art project, you send it to another family or class and they finish it. Like, or there's Skype dates where you can talk over the phone. And um, we Skyped with a class in Canada and they showed us snowballs that our kids had never seen being from Texas. Um, There's all these, uh, you know, citizen science where everyone goes to their own local pond and they gather 10 drops of pond water and look at it under a microscope and post your results on a website. And you can look all around the world what the other kids are posting and see if you found similar um, microorganisms. There's tons of those citizen scientists. There's like a bird count one. There's plant some tulips and tell us when they bloom and you can watch the map grow red as the as the sun is moving into the northern hemisphere like they slowly start popping up on the map there's just like all these cool projects that you can do with your kids um that yeah just yeah that sounds mm-hmm. really great that's wonderful well i'm excited to get my copy of that i have growing up global and it's chock full of ideas yeah. but Um, That sounds really great too. So thanks for sharing that with Mm -hmm. us. Okay. We are ready to dive into the short answers and I'll ask you a series of short questions that you can answer with short and sweet answers. Okay. Okay. What's your favorite place to travel with kids? Ah, I'm going to say the Yucatan in Mexico. Wow. Okay. What is the worst cultural faux pas you've made? Um, I'm left-handed. And when I was eating in Morocco with my hands, I kept using my left hand and that's your potty hand. That's your bathroom hand. So you can't use it. And I was just insulting everyone all over the place. Oh no. Okay. What's your favorite food in your, in any country? Just pick a country. Um, let's see. I mean, I love pao de queijo, but I love uh, tacos al carbon in Mexico that have pineapples on it. It's like a pork taco. It's so good. Oh, yum. I've never tried that. Okay. What's your top airplane tip for traveling with kids? Um, lollipops. Definitely lollipops because they last a long time. They can fit in your bag and they don't usually melt. <laughs> Good one. Okay. Which airport do you love the most and why? Uh, well, I want to say Chicago because that's where my family is and I can <laughs> go visit them. Yeah. Um, and it does have a very cool play area. So I am going to stick with O'Hare. It does. Yes. I like that Mm -hmm. too. Um, I was stuck there once for five and a half hours with a two year old and eight month old by myself. So that play area saved. us. Um, (laughs) okay. Street food. Yes or no. I do do it. I know that I don't do meat, but I'll do anything else. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite word to say in Spanish? Saca puntas. It just means sharpener, pencil sharpener, but I really like it. (laughs) Okay. If someone gave you 200,000 flight miles that had to be used tomorrow, where would you go and why? I really, really, really want to go to (gasps) Tanzania because, and I know that's just like so cliche, but I really want to go on a safari and I want to learn about the Maasai tribe. And I've just 
for some reason, I've always wanted to go to Tanzania. That's neat. My sister lives in Tanzania. Oh, cool. I'll go yeah. visit her. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. If you were given magical powers to learn another language while you slept, what language would you choose? I do wish I could speak Chinese. I do. Mm-hmm. I just, it was too hard. I took a semester and it was so difficult. And so I really wish I had magical powers to learn it. Yeah, that would be amazing to have magical language. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us today. I just want to make sure that um, everyone knows where to find you. So if you could tell us where we can find you online. Sure. So anywhere, um, any of the social media, I'm always Kid World Citizen. So Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, it's always no dashes, no spaces, just kid world citizen, one word. Okay. Well, we'll put links to your connections in the show notes as well. And I look forward to staying connected with you. Definitely. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. you. This was awesome. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the very first episode of the Global Mom Show. I'm so excited that you are here and I can't wait to see where this journey takes us. If you like what you heard and you want to hear more, please just take a few minutes to go into iTunes right now, subscribe to this podcast and leave a review. I'll be posting new episodes every week. And when you subscribe, it means you won't miss an episode. Leaving a short review will help more global moms find this podcast easily in iTunes. Thanks again for joining me today. I hope that you are encouraged and inspired by Becky to live a globally minded life wherever you are and teach your kids to do the same. I'm Mary Grace Otis, and you can find me and all the show notes and additional information and articles at theglobalmom.com.